Hello everyone, my name is Corazar, and welcome back to the Vintage Story Guide. We have made it to new lands, and they are just as rainy, just not at the moment. Soon, though. And today, we have some big plans, because I want to get farming. But first, we need to have some place to put our bed down and to cower when big bad wolves and drifters come looking for our blood. Without further ado, I think we need to build our first house out here on the New Plains. And I know just where to put it. And this house is going to be bigger, better, have a thousand rooms. It will put the old house to absolute unending shame. I hope you're ready for it. And there she is. What a beaut. I don't think I could have ever built a better house than this one. Well, what do you mean it's a dirt hut? This is not a dirt hut. This is an earthen berm. Yes, this is where we will begin to conquer the world. Oh, crappy door, my old friend. How I missed you from our old home. <gasps> you worked. <laughs> In order to start farming, you need four basic things. One, you need seeds. We have them in that pot behind me. Two, you need dirt. The better dirt, the better, obviously. Three, you need a hoe. Probably a couple because they break quickly. Four, a barrier, wall, or ditch that you plan to dig or build around your farms. Oh, and number five, obviously, water. So we'll go ahead and make a hoe. In fact, I'll make two. We will use the napping menu to pick the flint hoe head, and we'll go ahead and connect this. And again! With that done, we can slap these bad boys onto some sticks, and we have our hoes. And while I was getting ready to start talking about the types of dirt, I gotta notice that a light temporal storm is approaching. Temporal storms are one of the Lovecraftian horror themed things about this game. We will need to make some preparations first because temporal storms are not to be taken lightly, even the light ones. First off, we are going to want to collect some of these stones we see lying around. Because similarly to other block games, in Vintage Story, mobs, including drifters, cannot spawn on blocks that are consider half blocks or blocks that contain a smaller object inside them, such as stones. In our previous area, we were surrounded by shale on pretty much all sides. Here we're getting a sort of mix of granite and limestone. Different stone types have different uses. Some of them can be used to nap tools in the same way that flint is, but most of them, except for obsidian, are not as durable as flint tools. Limestone, however, is not strong enough to be napped into tools, but it can be used to make other things instead. And oh, we found some more lead. And you'll see in the upper left hand corner that same HUD clock mod that I showed you in an earlier episode also shows the status of any announced storms. And the game does announce when storms are, are about to happen. They'll give you a 10 hour warning, which is roughly, I think an eight or nine minute warning in real time. And then when it gets closer, you'll get a half an hour in game warning. And while we're here, I spy some flax. Don't mind if I do. With limestone in hand, we're going to run back home and lay these down. And of course, there is a rift right outside our front door. Now we have a pretty small house, so we can go ahead and pretty easily use these stones to cover our floor. This should prevent drifters from spawning in here. I don't know if the rules have changed in version 1.16. I don't think they have, but drifters shouldn't be able to spawn in here. And we might end up going out and tackling a few drifters because there are some goodies we can get, but the game didn't really give me enough advance warning to prepare more formidable defenses, so we might just have to ride this storm out. 
It used to be that you could actually sleep through these temporal storms and thereby just skip them altogether. However, in 1.16, although there is an option to allow you to skip them via sleeping again, since that is not the default experience, I didn't turn that on. And what will happen is, if you're sleeping in a bed at the time that the storm hits, it will bump you back out of bed, so there's no possibility of sleeping early to pass the storm. And I think I'm going to open the corners of my house a bit like this. Drifters are just a little taller than one block, so they can't get through these holes. And while they can swing their arms through them, they can't really throw stones very well through them. They'll actually hit the block here, and if they're stacked up, they'll kind of end up hitting each other and helping me kill them. We do want to kill a few drifters in this storm because we still haven't gotten what we need in order to be able to respawn in a place of our choosing. And I'd really like that so I don't have to run back next time we're killed by a wolf. And I have already heard wolves in the forest over there. Okay, I've rearranged everything, got the stones down, all our blocks are covered, and these shouldn't be able to spawn on top of this either, because it's not really a full block. They, again, need a full actual block to spawn. We also want to get our healing poultices on our bar, and I've made sure that we are gassed up with food. I have a full meal right here, so if we start getting low in the middle of this storm, we'll be able to eat and I think we're about ready. And there we go, folks. We just got the warning that the light temporal storm is imminent. Just a bit of a warning to all of you who might have any motion sickness issues. You might want to squint at this or maybe even skip this portion of the video altogether. I will see if I can put a timestamp to skip to in the video when I am done editing this. But here we go, folks. We are about to experience our first temporal storm. And here we go. Everything starts turning brown and rusty. And our gear has started spinning backwards. So no matter where you go in a temporal storm, you will always have your gear spinning backwards. And it gives this trippy sound effect to everything around you. That sort of bleep 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 kind of Twilight Princess sounding stuff. That is actually the sound of the drifter's normal growls being filtered through this other filter. Double, a double-headed drift? What? Okay, this is new to me. I have not seen this before. Double-headed drifter. I don't like that very much. <laughs> I do not like that at all. That is brand new. We're going to blow through so many of these spheres and try to kill these drifters. But you know what? It might end up being worth it. So I'm going to cheese these drifters as best I can and hopefully we survive. We'll see how this goes. We have a tainted drifter over here. I've seen them before. And these drifters that, that are sort of flickering, they're sort of not quite real. They've been partly transported here from the rest world, but not entirely. Ow, oh, that hurt. So see, okay, there we go. So we've now taken some damage. And if we use this horsetail poultice, we can right-click, and it will heal us two points. Now, we're wearing very light armor, so it won't affect it, but heavier armors can affect how much healing you get from each poultice use. Now these tainted drifters, the, the bigger and better the drifter, the more likely you are to get drops from them, which probably shouldn't surprise anybody. And some dr drifters actually have a slightly altered drop table of contents. For instance, you can get rusty gears from all drifters but surface drifters, which have a special smaller loot table. It seems we've gotten them all for now. More flax. Okay, and can we reach you? Hey, we can, more flax. And we got you, can I chop you up? No. Oh, and the storm seems to be waning, okay. These storms last a variable length of time. I think it's anywhere from five to 10 hours. 
and about half an in-game hour before it ends, you'll get the, the waning message. And if there were any drifters left, this being a light one, I think we took care of them all. If there were any drifters left, half of the ones that spawn during the storm will despawn immediately upon the end of the storm. Now when the storm ends, oh, there we go, the normal temporal conditions will resume and our gear will start spinning forwards again. But if a temporal storm, especially a heavy one, goes on for a long time, you can end up with your temporal stability being quite low and have to deal with that for a bit after the storm. Got him. Come on, buddy. Oh, and there he goes. He just disappeared. Now, as you can see, our gear is going back up. I'm going to rush outside really quick. Take a quick peek around. I want to see this double-headed drifter. What's he even look like? Oh, that's spooky. Oh, his head's been split open. Oh man, let's uh, let's get you. Oh, he had two rusty gears. Wow, but still not what I'm looking for. Well, with that out of the way, and our door not breaking, I'm going to clean up our mess here, and I'm going to sleep, and I'll bring you all back in the morning when we're ready to go and talk about soil types. With Ho at the ready, we're going to go out and find us some dirt, as if we weren't already surrounded by it. But I'm looking for some specific dirt, and I saw some over here. There are three main kinds of farmable dirt in Vintage Story from the lowest grade to the middle grade to the high grade. And here we have low fertility soil. You want to stay away from this when you're farming. You can use this for anything else you want, such as building mud brick or making packed dirt or making cob or just for papering over holes in the ground or what have you. But for farming, this stuff is worthless. We're going to go ahead and we're going to actually hoe one of these blocks. When I hover the mouse over it, at the top there, it shows the nutrient levels. 25% N for nitrogen, 25% phosphorus, and 25% potassium. And it'll give you the growth speed of each type of crop, as well as the current moisture. And I think almost all or all blocks start out fully moist when you hoe them for the first time. Each seed type that you have, and I'm going to have to go get some seeds to show this. As I was saying, each seed type that you have has a different amount of nutrient consumption attached to it. So this flax requires potassium, and it's going to use 50 nutrients. That 50 equates to 50% of the nutrients in here. So anything below 50% means that this farmland will be dropped to 0% fertility before the crop is even done growing, at which point you are stuck waiting for the farmland itself to recover while the crop is still draining it. Not ideal. The minimum, the bare minimum you want to use is medium fertility soil, and luckily we are surrounded by this stuff. I'm going to go ahead and hoe that. Medium fertility has 50% nutrients across the board, and we have growth speeds of almost 100% across the board. As those nutrients drop, they will slowly decrease in speed to 66% at 25% and lower at the bottom end of the percentage of fertility. I also want to showcase one of the other mods we have on here. Uh, it is called Farmland Drop Soil by Copy Girl. It is a little mod that overwrites a feature in Vintage Story. Normally, when you create farmland and then dig it up with a shovel, you get nothing back. This dirt just disobeys the laws of nature and it goes away. However, what this little mod does is when you dig up the soil, it tries to find the nearest type of fertility dirt and it will generate that kind of dirt block. So this is low fertility. The nutrient levels are at maximum for this. So when we break this, we will get a low fertility soil block back. Same here, where since these nutrient levels are at the maximum for medium, then we can dig up a block of medium soil. If we were to have planted something in here, that drained one or more of its nutrients down, when we dug it up, there would be a percent chance based on how far the nutrient levels are from the maximum that we would get a, either a low or medium fertility soil block back. In our last episode, we also came across some terra preta, that very dark 
loamy soil out here on the hillsides. And that is the current best soil in the game. There is a fourth kind of soil that you can make and farm in. However, you have to make it using medium fertility soil and some fertilizer, and we don't have access to that yet. So I've gone and pinned those Terra Preta deposits to my map so I can see them even when I'm not looking at the map and when they're off the edges of it. And we're going to go and dig up that dirt and bring it back for inspection. Terra Preta is one of those things where it looks like it would be easy to spot, but I guarantee you will walk by so many deposits of Terra Preta when you're playing and turn around after the 10th time you've been through an area and realize, oh, this has been waiting here the entire time. And you will face palm, dig up the dirt, bring it home, and be happy. Oh, and we have some copper here. Even better. What a great start. And butterflies. Who doesn't love butterflies? When you're looking for Terra Preta, while I think there may be some spawns on the ground, like flat, like on flat ground, they're impossible to find because you have to be looking directly at the block with no grass in, in the way to tell that it's any different. And yes, that is a dirt hut that I made on our first night in this plane when I was trying to get to that ridge. Let's go ahead and dig that up. But yes, look at sides of hills and look for dark patches and you are sure to eventually find some terra preta. It's important to, when you're digging out terra preta, find the bottom of it. And if it intersects an area of flat land, look at it. See there? It says terra preta grassy up at the top of the screen. There's still more here. So I've, I've seen deposits where people have looted the terra preta and missed, I don't know, 10 or 20 still waiting to be dug up. Oh, and we are out of shovel. Time for new shovel. Back to work. And like that, the deposit is empty. And I have to say, we really did kind of hit a jackpot here because farming speed is very important, especially in the early game when we are going to be needing to gear up for our first winter and have some food prepped and stored and preserved. So being able to grow our crops faster is of incredible importance. And right as we got here, I did spy over here another trader. Let's go give him a visit. And our trader friend is right next to a blue clay deposit. Oh no. Oh, this is terrible. Oh no, you're here. Okay. Whew. It is possible that sometimes these caravans or these wagons do spawn without traders. It's kind of rare, uh, but when it happens, it's pretty unfortunate because these are few and far between. And you are an artisan. Hello, Adachi the artisan. What do you have for us? Okay, so you'll buy beeswax at a kind of steep price, not gonna lie. You'll buy peat. I know where to get some peat. And you're kind of a cheapskate. We do have those rough diamonds, but you want better ones than we have. You'll buy charcoal, fancy planters and fat, and you'll sell us, oh man, interesting stuff. Well, Adachi, you are not really useless to us because we will get some of these as a renewable resource. Peat isn't renewable, but we can dig up a lot of it around here. Beeswax will be renewable eventually, as is charcoal with some effort. And fat is also renewable. And I'm sure we'll find more peridot and diamonds and maybe some emeralds in the future. But for now, we're going to go and head back home and continue our discussion about soil. But not before we get some more reeds. And with the afternoon drawing on, we are back home with this almost full stack of Terra Preta. This is an amazing find in the early game. Let's go ahead and since we can recover it, we're going to give it a hoe. So here we go. Ah, so this one started out with no moisture, and I think I think the reason the others may have begun moisturized is because we hoed them near a source of water. 
You'll see the nutrient levels here are 80 across the board. However, because of the moisture being low, crops won't grow very fast in it. Let's pick it up and we'll put it outside in the rain. Here we go. Moisturized. So here we have growth speeds around 120% across the board. Crops will grow faster until those values go down. And like I said, so earlier I pointed out the nutrient consumption and didn't finish the thought, but different crops have different amounts of consumption. From the humble parsnip, to the more average onion, to the very potassium and greedy flax. And sometimes you can get away with planting multiple crops worth of the same crop in better soil like terra preta. For instance, we could probably plant two or three harvests worth of parsnips before the terra preta got down to medium to low fertility levels. Because like I said, the nutrients will recover while you're growing crops in them. However, it is generally more advantageous to rotate your crops because the nutrient that is not currently being drained will naturally turn faster. But with that out of the way, we need to get to our next topic on farming is figuring out where to put your farm. In the early game, we don't have buckets because we can't make wood because we don't have a saw because we don't have any copper. So we are kind of at the mercy of the land here in deciding where we put our crops. So we are in an area, oh hey Flax, we are in an area of lots of rainfall. So we could potentially put our crops outside nowhere near water and never water them ourselves manually. And we might have a decent yield because of the very common rain here. It seems to rain at least once a day. However, I don't like banking on that. It's a little bit risky or if not risky, then at least time consuming because we would then need to make a watering can. And every now and then, if rain doesn't come for a little while, we would need to go out and spend time watering them. So it is more advantageous to put your crops near water. Now I have heard tell of other block games that exist where if you have a single block of water, you could have crops growing up to four blocks away at full speed. Not so in Vintage Story. In Vintage Story, it is best to put your crops as close to water as possible because the farther away they are, the less moisture they will get. I can't demonstrate that now because of all the rain, so you have to take my word for it. Water will irrigate up to three blocks away, but at much lower level. So a block of farmland three blocks away from water will only have 25% moisture, and the fourth one will have zero, unless it's raining. This means that it can be advantageous to make your plots in rows where you have three rows of farmland blocks and then one row of water. Let's go out and find a spot. I think this one is still too close and it's still too small. We need a decent sized pond to put down almost a full stack of dirt. I think we're going to go right down here because it's still pretty close but not right next to the house where I want to have room to build things. And if, we, oops, if I break my knees, I think we can make a little staircase to go up here if we break this block here. Perfect. So we're going to use our shovel to expand this pond a bit because running water will still moisten nearby blocks of farmland. So we can make little channels that come off of this pond, like say, for instance, here. And this flowing water, if we put farmland on either side of it, it will still irrigate it. And we're going to push back this part of the land here because, and look at that, we uncovered more terra preta. Wow, that is, that is super lucky. I have literally never found a terra preta just sitting out there in the middle of the ground for me to find. That is so stupid lucky. Anyway, we're going to push this land back a bit because when we build our defenses against rabbits from eating our crops, we need to be able to make sure that they can't just jump from, say, this block here over whatever fence we, we build or 
so that they can't jump from up here and fall down onto our fence and then from there into our farm. And we are one short. Ah, so close. So close to being perfect, but you know what? This is already a perfect start to a farm. We're going to go ahead and finish out this irrigation. And we're going to drop one piece of regular old medium dirt here. We're not going to use that to farm, but we will need to cover that up. And that's because rabbits can spawn anywhere you see this tall grass. So if we make a perimeter around our farmland, but we leave any blocks inside the fence that has grass in it, then we can still get rabbits in our farm even if we were to say enclose it completely. Now, of course, as we've seen with the drifter trick for the temporal storm, we can just take a piece of stone, or a single stone, and just drop it on the ground there. Now you will notice that your farmland, if you leave it fallow, one, it will recover faster, the nutrients that is, and it will also grow grass and horsetail, which is another way of gathering the components you need to make your healing poultices, at least in the early game. The grass that grows on farmland does not spawn rabbits, and that's because farmland is not a full block. Rabbits need both the conditions of a piece of tall grass and a full-size block to spawn on. So they cannot spawn, for instance, here, but if we left this open, they could spawn here. And there you go. That is all ready for planting. Now, we're not going to go ahead and plant yet because we do need to, like I said, block off rabbit spawns. And we want to do that before we plant because rabbits are attracted to, I think, any stage of growth. So we are going to get some kind of material to put along here. We could just make a two block tall wall of dirt. Walls of dirt that were kind of ugly, I'd rather avoid that. So we do have a couple other options. One is if we can find enough stone, we could make some dry stone walls. Dry stone wall is made using six pieces of stone of any type, as long as they're the same type, arranged in your crafting grid like so, with three across the middle and three across the bottom. However, each set of six stone only gets you one dry stone fence. While we could spend forever looking for limestone or other stones, or we could also pan for it if we found enough sand and gravel, that would take a very long time. So I think another option is going to be our better bet, and that is rough-hewn fences, or wattle fences. And I need to go and find some more wood. Now, I have already heard the cries of wolves over there, so I'm going to go over there and try to survive. We'll see how it goes. And that's one tree down, and we got four seeds out of that. Axe not strong enough. Now, in addition to a fence, we'll need a way in and out. So we're going to make a gate, and we'll do that first. Let's look up gate. So we have a rough hewn gate. So we need an axe and a bunch of sticks, and a bunch of logs. That will get us two gates. Okay, that's more than enough. And this is sticks and logs. We get, we get 12. That's a very good ratio. I'm thinking we'll need a few more. Probably that should do. And we will put our gate, I think, right here at this end. We'll need part of one more set. So let's go and do that. And 
And done. Close you up. And then, like I said, we need to push this land back. We want about a three block gap. And there we go. We have some farmland that ought to be pretty safe from attack by hungry, angry rabbits. Let's go get our seeds. I'm going to arrange these and order them based on their nutrient. So we have K, we have P, and another P, and then these are all N. I'm arranging them like this in my inventory so that it's easier when it comes time to rotate crops. So I want to do about two rows of each type. So we're going to do all the flax, because these are all the K we have. And these first two rows. And I will leave the rest of this row open because I'm going to probably take a quick spin around the countryside and see if I can find a few more seeds for this to fill this out. Next we will do the P-based nutrients, the phosphorus nutrients. So we have parsnips galore. And then we have a few onions. For our nitrogen-based plants, I'm going to focus on the turnips for now. Because vegetables give more satiation when cooked in a meal than grains do. That is a sight to behold. Six rows of terra preta, full of crops. And we can, when we stand, stand in here and look at our crops, it will tell us their stage of growth, and different crops have different numbers of growth stages that don't necessarily correspond to how long it takes them to grow. And we can keep an eye on their growth speed, the nutrient levels, and the current moisture. So in probably under a week, maybe six days or so, we should have our first crops. That's a wrap for this episode of the Vintage Story Guide. I hope you've enjoyed our little adventure in farming and the surprise of our first temporal storm. My name has been Kurazar. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.